I needed about 60 seconds more, but Judy, but that's okay. I'm good now. Good morning and welcome home, Ironton First. Good to have you all with us. Good to have all of you that are hopefully watching online with us this morning. Uh, it's been a while since we've had a Sunday morning anthem. I'm finally able to get up and downstairs and, and uh, just found a song this week that we want to try out on you. So uh, we will invite you to stand as we sing it and as you kind of get in touch with the tune and the words, join us as we sing. I realize it'll probably just be us up here at first, but hopefully you'll catch on. It's a fairly easy song to sing, but uh, let's stand and, and uh, worship God this morning. <clears throat> Gracious God, you invite us into your presence, into this house as the great host. 
Lord, you invite us to be one with each other. Lord, you want to teach us this morning what it means to be part of the family of God. And so as we gather to worship, let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Let us acknowledge you as our Heavenly Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing if you would. Chris and Judy are going to lead us in a couple of great hymns. Chris? seated. A few announcements just to bring you up to date with what's going on here at Ironton. And again, remember a lot of this can be found out on our link tree. And so we invite you to go out and check that out. But our Bible study and question and answers with the pastor is this Wednesday night. Bible studies at 630. We will be starting John chapter 5, John's gospel chapter 5. And the Q&A with the pastor at 730 has is quickly becoming our, our uh, biggest hour of, of just discussion and talk about uh, what's going on here in our messages. We uh, cover the forge and also the message delivered here this morning. So we invite you all that are watching us online. We put Zoom links out for our Bible connection and also for the Q&A. We invite you to join us for that. Ladies, your Bible study was moved a week due to Valentine's Day. It is Wednesday February 21st, at, or, or Monday, Wednesday, February 21st at 6.30. What? Just Monday. Just Monday. Okay. Monday, Wednesday. No, I, yeah, just Monday. Uh, our first church praise singers, uh, they are going to begin practicing here this month, and we would love for you to join us. If you have an interest in being part of that and making a joyful noise, please see Chris or Judy or myself. Uh, our youth are planning a ski trip for February 12th, and so that's this coming weekend. Uh, if you are interested in going with the youth, and adults are invited to go on that as well, if you like to ski, uh, please see Amy to get signed up for that. I don't know exactly what time they'll be leaving, probably pretty early that morning, 
and taking the bus and some cars, and so uh, please see her. Last week, uh, we had a special offering for the elevator fund, but we want to invite you that you can always give toward the elevator fund. If you would like to do that over and above your tithe, we invite you to just uh, make out a check and put elevator down in your memo so we know what to uh, put it toward, and we will take care of that. But looking forward to finally starting construction on that here very soon. Uh, we're working on getting some plans drawn up and getting that done, and then hopefully as the uh, winter weather breaks, we'll be able to get started on that. Also, uh, we need a few folks to uh, join our tech team. I don't know if we have a, yeah, we do. Um, I didn't know if we had a slide for that or not. But we need a few folks uh, to join our tech team. We are looking for someone to help us with our website. And we're also looking for an assistant producer, someone who can kind of learn the ropes of, of uh, how we put the broadcast out each week. And so if you're interested in uh, either of those two opportunities, please talk to me. Uh, we would love to find some folks to help us out there. Uh, one of the things we discovered while I was on my sabbatical is that we're a little thin in that department. And so we need a few more folks that know how to do uh, all the technology stuff that goes on here. So any other announcements that I was not made aware of that didn't make the cut before we did slides? Anything else going on? We good? All right. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward and, and meet me down front as we worship the Lord in giving. Ushers, come forward. Please stand for the doxology. and merciful God. We offer our gifts to you this day with open hands and open hearts. We know there have been days when we have clung to money for our security to try to control our future. At times we've been tempted to believe that in gaining more we would find salvation. Open our ears and our minds to hear the truth from your Apostle Paul. We need only hold firmly to the good news of Christ's death and resurrection. It alone will save us. In the holy name of Jesus, our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, we're well, time for our children's corner this morning. Good morning. Before we get started here, and while the kids are making their way down here, Amy wanted me to make an announcement here. Uh, little girls that used to come to the church here, she's been here from time to time, named Mariah Bowman. Uh, they had a house fire. So Amy's taken up donations for the family there. Anything you want to give, uh, money would certainly be appreciated. Um, clothes, food, anything that someone that's uh, been through a house fire might need. So if, if you'd like to donate to that, just see Amy and she'll, she'll direct you on how to do that. Uh, which actually <laughs> goes right into our lesson today. Um, we're starting a new series here, and this series is called Compassion. 
And compassion is caring enough to do something about someone else's needs. And that's just perfect for today. So, every, how are you guys doing this morning? Good? Does everybody live somewhere? Do you all live somewhere? Have somewhere you live? Do you have, um, do you have people that live around you? And what are they called? Neighbors, absolutely, neighbors. But you live in a neighborhood, right? No matter if you live way out in the country, you still got neighbors somewhere. I mean, they might be three or four miles away, but you still got neighbors, right? So the neighborhood just doesn't always have to be like right there next to you. That's your next door neighbor, but your neighbor can be anywhere. Do you all ever remember any instances where they helped you out or you helped them out? Or and it could be something as small as watching their house while they were on vacation or them watching your house while you went on vacation. So have you all ever done anything to help your neighbors? <laughs> okay. I guess not. <laughs> but, but what we're going to do this, this month is we're going to learn about some ways that we can have compassion for people and help them out. Because who wants us to do that? Why, why would we want to do that? Jesus, okay, somehow they magically got that answer. Yeah, always the right answer. <laughs> okay, so before we go upstairs, let's have a little prayer. And uh, then we'll go upstairs and learn more about compassion and caring enough for others. Lord, we thank you for another day, another beautiful day to be and gather in your house today. Lord, we pray for compassion. We pray for compassion for other people that we can... We can help them out in your name, and they can see your light shine through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Eric, that's a great opening to the new sermon series. It's perfect. It's perfect, yes. What's that time of the morning where we like to share how good God has been to us? If you have a breakthrough, something where God has been moving in your life, and and has uh, shown up and shown off. We'd like to share that with one another. We'd like to celebrate with you. So uh, how has God blessed you this morning or this week? Who's got a praise to share? No one has been blessed this week. I'm so sorry for you. Yes, I, there, not everyone was as fortunate, but I was with you uh, on that, just praying that the ice storm would not knock a lot of power out. And so we had very few power outages in our area. And so we do praise God for that. Joyce and I were trying to make plans like, okay, who are we, who are we going to stay with if our power goes out? And you all were on the list. <laughs> now, if that doesn't make you feel uncomfortable, the pastor's staying at your house, right? Anybody else have a joy to share? Praise, birthdays, anniversaries? This past week, um, I know uh, we celebrated a little bit last week. Bert Payne had his birthday. And Bert, if you're watching, and I think you are, uh, he's, he's out of town on vacation. Uh, happy birthday. Any other joys we don't want to share this morning? Yes, Amy? All right. All right. We have 12 uh, teens with us this morning and little ones. Yep. Praise the Lord. Glad our youth group is growing. Yes. Amen. Anything else? Well, we have much to pray for and pray about. Um, yes. Joyce. Amen. Yes, our, our elevator fund passed a big benchmark this week. So thank you all for your generosity with that. All right, let us be in an attitude of prayer. There'll be an opportunity for you to lift up the concerns on your heart this morning. And uh, then I'm going to invite you to join us in a breakthrough prayer in the Lord's Prayer before we get into our message today. <clears throat> 
holy and gracious God, we come to you in prayer, not because you are unaware of what we have need of or what our concerns are, but because you call us to be people of prayer. We often pray uh, in ways we shouldn't. We ask according to our own desires and not according to your will. Forgive us for asking such selfish demands. Forgive us when we fail to love you as we should. You have provided all that we have need of. You demonstrated your love toward us while we were yet sinners by sending your only son, Jesus, to be our sin sacrifice. You have extended an invitation to put our faith in the atoning work of your son. Help us to walk in that faith. We bring to you the concerns of our heart and of our community. For the many in need of your healing, we lift up those names that are on our hearts. For those that are suffering and in need of provision, help us provide as you see fit. For those families that mourn the loss of a loved one today, provide comfort for their aching hearts. For those that are wandering aimlessly, seeking direction, provide wisdom and discernment. For those that are battling mental fatigue, emotional exhaustion, and broken hearts, provide rest for their body, mind, and soul. For the unspoken concerns that are hiding in our hearts, draw them into the light where Jesus is so that we can find wholeness again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you always give what we need. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. We thank you for the multitude of blessings we have shared with one another today. Lord, for the confidence and joy and hope we have because we walk daily with you, we give you thanks. And we share together our prayer of thanksgiving as we say in unison our breakthrough prayer. And all God's people said together, Lord, we put our trust and hope in you. Lead us today and every day. We remember your word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Thank you for loving us. We give you praise in the name of Jesus who died for our sins and rose again for our salvation. And we ask it all according to your will and according to the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. looking forward to kicking off my first sermon series of the year. In some ways, it actually builds off of the last series of the year. During Advent, we did a series called Coming Home for Christmas, and in one of those sermons, I used an illustration of Kevin McAllister from the movie Home Alone. Home Alone is a famous Christmas movie that was made in 1990 and directed by Chris Columbus, and if you've forgotten the plot, the McAllister family accidentally leaves young Kevin by himself when they go on vacation. And at first, Kevin's elated. He's just, he's excited about them being gone. Um, he's eating ice cream. He's jumping on the bed. 
Uh, he's watching movies. Uh, he thinks that he has somehow made his family disappear. And he can do whatever it is he wants. But when two robbers show up, he realizes that his home is what needs defending. Not just for himself, but for his family, whom he now misses. And in one of the final scenes, his mother finally arrives home. And that's a whole story in and of itself of the travails she has trying to get back to him. And she's worried. She's, she's repentant. She's actually she's hesitant to see if Kevin will accept her and accept her apologies for leaving him behind. And yet, when she gets home, he runs to her. She is his mother, and he has defended their home. The rest of the family then comes tumbling in to celebrate Christmas together. And so I thought of that, that movie once again, since it was still fresh in my mind from December. And I thought of this concept of home. What is home to you? What is home to you? Is it the physical address where you live? Or is there something more to calling a place home? Well, over the years, I've lived in many different places. I've lived in apartments. In fact, my first apartment was a little apartment above a garage. A little two-bedroom or two-room place. Uh, I've lived in mobile homes, I've lived in town homes, ranch style homes, two story arts and crafts homes, and now I live in an industrial loft apartment. There were no two places that resembled another. Each one of them was different, which meant we were constantly buying different furniture. They loved to see me come in the store. Each one was different, yet let each, let, uh, each one became a home to me. The old expression says, home is where the heart is. And if, if that sentiment is true, then I guess any place where love dwells can be considered home. I've also had the opportunity to visit a good number of homes over the years. Some of them were immediately warm and inviting and they just felt like home to me. The people that lived there just made you feel like part of the family. I remember many years ago, um, a lady that was in our church at the time by the name of Mary Steele, um, she would invite me over for a visit. And she was getting on in years, and, uh, I, and I, I think she just enjoyed having the company. And so anytime I would go over for a visit, she would always lead me into the den where they had this big lazy boy chair where her now deceased husband used to sit. And she would invite me to sit in that chair and she would tell me to kick back, take a nap while she made something for us to eat. She was a wonderful lady. And it was very easy to preach her funeral. She made me feel at home. In fact, she told others I was her, she only had one son, I was the other son. But there's been other homes that I visited that were cold and uninviting. And I won't share any examples of that because I want to protect the names of those who have such homes. Have any of you ever visited a home that, was, that you just immediately felt welcomed? You ever feel, feel one? How about the other ones? Have you been to some that you just couldn't wait to get out of? That thing that makes us feel at home is a thing called hospitality. And this series is all about hospitality. Hospitality starts with God. When you think about it, God was the first host. And so I also want to welcome all of our folks that tune in right about now to watch us online. We hope that we're hospitable to you. We welcome you. We are so thankful that you took part of your Sunday out and spent some time with us. Thank you for being here. Take a second. Tell us where you're watching from. We, always, we have people watch from all around the world, and we always love to have you. But thank you 
for joining us today. You're part of our family. Well, I want to read our text this morning and and then unpack this thought about hospitality. It's in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault under the wa- from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Then jumping down to verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The root word for hospitality is the Latin word hospice, which means host, guest, or stranger. The biblical form of hospitality was always oriented toward the stranger rather than this idea of lavishly entertaining friends. It carries with it the connotation to help those who are in need and in our vicinity from our text, we read of God creating this marvelous universe. He created the day and the night. He created the earth and the seas. And he adorned it with all the beauty uh, that we see around us. And he provided food for humanity. And then he created humanity. Here's the point we need to grasp. God created this planet before he created us. God made us a home to dwell in before we ever existed. And so that is why I say that hospitality starts with God. Hospitality is an attribute of God. And as we were created in his image, that attribute was instilled in us, or at least it was before sin broke that image. Hospitality in the ancient world focused on the stranger and the alien. Their condition was desperate. They were not part of the community or tribe or nation that they found themselves to be in. And because of this alienation, they would find themselves in immediate need of food and shelter. This was particularly true of widows, orphans, and the poor. In ancient biblical times, they would have had no family to rely on. They had no community status to get the help that they needed. There were no social programs. There was no warming shelters. There was no one that they could turn to. In the ancient world, the practice of hospitality meant graciously receiving an alienated person into one's land, home, or community and then providing directly for that person's needs. Hospitality played an important role in biblical ethics. We can see it in so many stories from Scripture, but one such instance is found in Genesis 18 and Abraham. It says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, the answer, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. 
Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. For the early church, there was a revival of this kind of hospitality. It kind of uh, fell on hard times as, as you get a little deeper into the Old Testament. Hospitality ceased to be something that folks were doing as much of. But in the early church, it had a revival. Hospitality became an expression of loving kindness in line with the teachings of Jesus. Most notably in his teaching from Matthew 25, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these my, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so Jesus underscored this idea of hospitality to those in need, and especially to those that are not like us in his story of the Good Samaritan. You probably recall that story. It said, in reply, Jesus said, a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, uh, uh, when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and he saw the man. He passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And so what did hospitality look like in the Bible? Acts of hospitality included the humble and gracious reception of travelers into one's home for food, lodging, and protection, like the instance I shared with Abraham. It also included permitting alienated persons to harvest the corners of one's fields, as in the story of Ruth. And you can go read that in Ruth chapter 2. The hospitable act of communal meal possesses great symbolic significance. In the ancient world, to share food with someone was to share life. Such a gesture of intimacy created a bond of fellowship. Jesus, of course, built a lot of relationships over communal meals. In fact, he ate with so many people that the Pharisees accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard. And as Joyce and I always say, there's not a greater metaphor for community than a shared meal. When the church began in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. They believed that when they ate together, the table became a sacred place and a sacred time. And wouldn't it be wonderful if our tables were once again sacred places and sacred time. Can I get an amen from the amen section? In the Old Testament, Israel was always pictured as the stranger or alien in a place that belonged to someone else. God was always the host. They depended on him and his hospitality to get by. God redeemed them from Egypt. He took care of them in the wilderness. 
He brought them to a land overflowing with milk and honey that he had prepared for them that was not their own when they arrived. And then in the New Testament, we see God not as host, but as guest. Jesus, God in the flesh, availed himself to the hospitality of others. As he traveled along, he was dependent on that hospitality. He shared a a table with tax collectors and sinners. But we also see Jesus playing the role of host as he feeds the multitudes with fish and bread. He is pictured often as the servant to humanity, and we see his demonstration of the humble host when he bows down to wash the disciples' feet. In our day, it is no different. All we have is provided to us as a gift from a loving and hospitable God. Go read James 1.17. We are strangers and pilgrims in this life, searching for a home whose builder and maker is God. And while we journey along, our providential God gives us what we need. We were alienated from God by sin, But by God's provenient grace, we have been invited to be part of God's family. And what a wonderful invitation of hospitality. We who don't deserve God's grace are offered it freely. Paul explained it this way. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of God's household. As followers of Christ... We're called to show the same kind of hospitality to others that God has shown to us. I want to invite you to go read Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 20. But let me highlight verse 13 from that passage. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Hospitality is to be something that is part of our daily routine. And it seems like some people are just given that gift of hospitality, doesn't it? It seems like some people just naturally have it. For the rest of us, Rick, we got to work at it. <laughs> we got to work at it. The writer of Hebrews encouraged us toward hospitality. He writes, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. And there are many other exhortations on how we as believers should show hospitality, and we're going to be covering a lot of those during the course of this series. By God's creation, we have seen his work of hospitality. All the world is a gift to humanity. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but we were rich before we were born. So how much more will he take care of us who put our faith in Christ? Poet Lucy Shaw writes, God's relationship with us surrounds us like a house. It is essential. The frame and backdrop for all thinking, being, and doing. We are at home in the divine presence in a way that is deeper than consciousness. And here's what I want you to do with what you've heard today. As you pray this week, I want you to focus on God as the author of hospitality and pray to him and meditate on his word with that thought in mind. Thank him for all the gifts he's provided for your care. And then begin to think of ways that you can Take those lessons learned and reciprocate. How can you demonstrate hospitality to others? And how could that gesture show others the love of God? Well, the Eucharist is a beautiful picture of hospitality as Jesus invites all to the table who've repented of their sin and desire to be in fellowship with others. And so as we break away from the sermon part of this morning and make our way toward Holy Communion, I want to thank everybody that's been watching us online and invite all that are here to take part with us around the table.